I am here because of the genocide which is happening in Gaza. And if it were not for Gaza, I would not be here. I am here fighting this election on the need to stop the genocide in Gaza. Now, the Workers' Party of Britain have a wonderful manifesto. They have policies on all the kinds of things the Labour Party has abandoned. They have policies on the nationalisation of public utilities. They have policies on the tuition fees for university students. And I should say, I live in a country, Scotland, which has the tuition fees for university students. So it most certainly is not impossible, and for Keir Starmer to pretend it is impossible is a complete and utter nonsense. They have policies on the National Health Service. Actually, I'm going, uh, if no one objects, I'm going to try to speak to you without the microphone because I think actually my natural voice is even more beautiful than my fact <laughs> Every election, you get lots of candidates, my entire <coughs> lifetime, you get candidates from the political parties will stand up and tell you that they are going to make the health service better, that they are going to make education better, that they are going to fix the potholes. And certainly, uh, ever since I was a student, for every election that's happened since Thatcher came to power, and since Blair adopted Thatcherism as the Labour Party's policy, every election has been followed, whatever the politician has said, by the health service getting worse, by education getting worse, and by the potholes getting worse. And frankly, whichever of the main parties anyone votes for, that is what's going to happen. So I, you don't need me to talk about that. I'm going to talk to you about Gaza and the genocide in Gaza. And it is a genocide. It's a genocide we have all witnessed. It's a genocide we are seeing in real time on our laptops, iPads and mobile phones. It's a genocide which is emotionally devastating. It's physically devastating to the people of Gaza. Can you imagine what those people are going through? But to us it's emotionally devastating. And I'll tell you bluntly, I've reached the stage where sometimes I can't look at my own children because it makes me cry thinking of the children I have seen killed in Gaza. It is that emotionally devastating. And this genocide did not start on the 8th of October. This genocide started 76 years ago. And we are only going now through a hotter phase because the slow genocide of the Palestinian people has been in progress and has been the plan ever since the formation of the State of Israel. And we live in a country which is continuing to send arms to Israel, which is continuing to give military training to Israel, which is continuing to give intelligence support aerial surveillance to Israel in real time, a country which is deeply complicit in that genocide. I want to see it stop. And I tell you this, I want to see absolutely the end of arms sales to Israel. I don't want a suspension. I want to see never again any arms sales to Israel. But let me say this to you as well. I don't just want to see an end to arms sales to Israel. I want to see an end to the terrorist state of Israel, an end to the apartheid state. There is no two-state solution. The idea of a two-state solution is a nonsense. There's not enough left of Palestine with the depredations on the West Bank, which is broken up into tiny pockets, and which gets smaller literally every single day. And in the last few weeks, three and a half thousand more Palestinian homes have been designated for removal and replacement by Israeli settlement. 
there is no possibility of a viable state consisting of the remnants of Palestine in the West Bank and what is left of devastated Gaza. What we need to see is a single unitary state of Palestine in which everybody is equal, be they Jewish, be they Palestinian, be they Christian, whoever they are of any religion or race, living in a modern, genuinely democratic state with no apartheid. We want an end to apartheid and an end to colonialism in the Middle East. And we are the only party that will say that. We are the only party that will say that. The Labour Party can't even condemn the genocide. They can't even condemn any single Israeli war crime. They can't even leave the Labour Friends of Israel. They can't even stop taking money from the Zionist lobby, even as the genocide continues. The attitude of the Labour Party has been utterly disgusting. And in the main parties in this country, you have no choice between main parties other than parties who are complicit in genocide. Not only are their economic policies so close you can't put a cigarette paper between them, not only are their immigration policies so close you can't put a cigarette paper between them, they are equally complicit in their support of genocide and their support of the state of Israel. Now then, I was in the International Court of Justice for the hearing of South Africa versus Israel. I was actually present in the court. And more than that, I was part of the movement, part of the intellectual formation of the policy that led South Africa to go to the court. I wrote articles on how to activate the Genocide Convention back in October and November of last year. My articles were sent by Andrew Feinstein and others to the government of South Africa. When the government of South Africa decided to take action against Israel at the court, they had my articles on the cabinet table in front of them when they took that decision. And I have never been prouder of anything in my entire life. I've spoken to the United Nations in Geneva about the genocide in Palestine. And if I can do that as an ordinary man, as somebody who used to be an ambassador but has no current formal position, how much more can I achieve if you give me a platform in the House of Parliament? That's why I'm asking you to send me that. And I want you to have this thought. We have to stop this genocide. And we can only stop it by ending the impunity of the political leaders, both Netanyahu and the Western political leaders who back him. We can only stop it by ending their impunity. But we have to stop it, because this will not be the last genocide of Muslims. And among other things, I believe, and I've been recently, I was in Pakistan, a uh, few weeks ago, I've been to Gujarat, I've been to Buj, and seen the markets where the massacre happened. I've been to Mandi and seen destroyed mosques. I've been to Mumbai, I've been to Delhi. The BJP are watching, and Modi is watching what Netanyahu is getting away with. And the next genocide of Muslims will occur in India unless we stop it. That is why this is not a normal election. It's very unusual in a general election to ask people to vote on the basis of foreign policy. But that is because the world is at an extremely dangerous period, an extremely dangerous period where not only is more genocide against Muslims threatening, but where we have lunatics pushing more and more to send long-range missiles to the Ukraine to fight a hot proxy war against Russia that risks dragging us all into nuclear conflagration. But 
military industrial complex, the arms industry controlling politicians, the mad war hawks are totally out of control and the world is on a career of destruction which we must stop. That is why I'm here. That is why I'm asking for your vote. And I do ask all of you here who live in Blackburn to say what I have said to your friends, to explain why I'm here, to explain the mission, to explain why we need your backing, we need your support, because this is quite literally a mission to save the world. Thank you. One of the biggest missions that we've got in a place like Blackburn is that the divisive politics are at their peak. And I know Blackburn very well. I know Blackburn like the back of my hand. And I know those communities. Do not allow them to divide you. Stand strong on the issue of Gaza. We do not apologise on the issue of Gaza. We do not apologise on the issue of human rights violations, whether that be in Gaza, whether that be in Kashmir, whether that be in any part of the world. And this is the only party, this is the only party that can say that. Ask the independents, ask your Labour candidate, ask your Conservatives, and even if you've got time, ask the Greens. What is their policy? Are they willing to stand there with the flag of Kashmir? Are they willing to stand with the flag of Gaza? Are they willing to say that? I can tell you the answer will be no, but ask them because that's your democratic right. That's your democratic right. And those filtered down messages that we're getting, and I'm coming all out here, George, those filtered down messages that we're getting from the independents, give them a shut up call and ask them, stand firmly on the issue of Gaza and Blackburn will stand behind you. Do not use your divisive politics to filter down the message of this party. There is nobody stronger. It does not matter whether you're Muslim or not. I have two brothers here. They are not Muslim, but I am proud to be standing here as a Muslim woman with these two brothers because what they have done, we should have done a very long time ago, Blackburn. A very long time ago, we had a chance and an opportunity. Let's not miss it. And on that note, I'm going to pass you on to the voice of those people, not just from yesterday, not in November, not on the 7th of October. For decades, we've been listening to George. We've now got to make sure that we stand with the Workers' Party and not just to elect Tim Craig and people like myself, but to make sure that George Galloway becomes your next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. <laughs> What a beautiful and powerful introduction, Shamas Sadiq, the next member of parliament for the Oldham East constituency. If you know people in Oldham, make sure that they get behind Shamas' campaign. He hasn't gone away, you know, Jack Straw. He's still here in Blackburn. His tentacles, demonic tentacles, still dangle here in the town, here in the Labour Party, and yes, here amongst the so-called independents. Let me tell you, when the next local elections come in Blackburn, there'll be a Workers' Party candidate in every ward in those local elections. <laughs> every single ward. We don't, uh, we don't tolerate betrayal. We don't tolerate fork-tongued deceivers. We'll have an honest Workers' Party candidate in every ward in the local elections. He hasn't gone away, you know, Jack Straw. Jack Straw is the epitome of the British colonial rule that many of you from your grandmothers and grandfathers can remember. 
divide and rule. Make sure that the power continues by dividing up all those who would stand against that power. Craig Murray's address, brief and yes, beautiful, shows you the kind of clarity of thinking, the kind of influence, not just in Britain, but across the world, that his writings were on the desk of the South African legal team when they put Israel on trial for genocide you have the chance here in Blackburn to have him as your MP rather than the nobodies who currently represent you in Parliament. I call them nobodies because I'm in the House of Commons and I have no idea who they are. If they walk through that door now, as God is my judge, I would not know who they are. They're do nothing, say nothing, waft nothing, occupiers of space, of seats in the House of Commons, making no difference whatsoever, either to the lives of the people in their town or the lives of people even worse off than the poorest person here in Blackburn. That's the truth of it. I'm not lying to you. I've been a member of parliament for 37 years. I've been sitting in this parliament for the last 70 days and I don't know who your MPs are. That's how effective their place in parliament is. In a sane country, Craig Murray would be the Foreign Secretary of Britain. Craig Murray, an ambassador who is too modest to blow his own trumpet. This man was an ambassador. The Honorable Craig Murray, His Excellency. Why was he sacked by Jack Straw? Too modest to tell you that. He was sacked by Jack Straw. You know for what? And I'm going to quote directly from the dismissal letter signed by Jack Straw, that he over-focused on human rights. Shame. Whose human rights? Muslim human rights. Where? In Uzbekistan. He was over-focused on the fact that the dictatorship in Uzbekistan was murdering torturing, disappearing, and jailing Muslims like many of the people in this room, like many of the people in this town. For standing up for them, Jack Straw sacked him. I have a long history myself with Jack Straw. If you want to read the debates in Parliament in the run-up to the Iraq War, Many of them on YouTube actually can watch them. <coughs> clash after clash after clash between me and Jack Straw, who was the mouthpiece of the Tony Blair government that caused the deaths of more than a million people in Iraq. And as I said, here in this town quite recently, when all these independents was sitting right in front of me, cheering me, and hailing the next member of parliament for Blackburn. I told them this. The worst memory I have of Blackburn was the sight of Muslims carrying Jack Straw on their shoulder 
in victory in 2005. Some of those are still alive. Some of those are still involved in the politics of making sure that the power stays in power. They carried them on their shoulder, literally, out of the count. Two years after, Jack Straw soaked in blood, gloried in the invasion and occupation of Iraq, which would go on to kill a million people and counting. I used the words redeemed. We have to redeem the reputation of the Muslim community in this town. If, on the other hand, at the height of another genocide, another bloodbath, we either directly, by voting Labour, or indirectly, by splitting the anti-Labour vote, we help Labour back into power to reward them for the genocide in Gaza. No redemption will be possible for anyone involved. I can see, I know, that not everyone here is a religious believer. I am. I believe there's a judgment day. And on that judgment day, I believe that we will be asked what we did during the genocide of the Palestinian women and children and men in 2024. We'll be asked, did we stand up against, did we curse it with our lips? Did we curse it in our hand? Did we put an X on a paper with that hand to stand up against it. And if we cannot answer that question positively, well, good luck to the person trying to enter heaven. This genocide of which Craig speaks is the worst thing we have ever seen. It's not the worst thing that's ever happened. There are many things. The partition of India. The war between Pakistan and Bangladesh. The Vietnam War. The destruction of Cambodia. We're all worse in quantum. The important word of what I just said was seen. This is the worst thing we've ever seen. And every one of us and our children have seen it. This marks, therefore, a key and vital difference in what's happening in Gaza now. Our children are asking us, what are you doing about what I am watching. I saw a picture yesterday of a dog with a baby in its mouth. A dead baby in its mouth. The dogs are feasting on the dead children under the rubble in Gaza. And our country is utterly complicit and co-responsible for these horrors, for this grotesque chamber of horrors that is the Gaza Strip today. For the reasons Craig mentioned and more, because you see, he said with diplomatic precision that this has been happening for 76 years. But actually, it's been happening for 107 years. 
since the day in the House of Commons when the British Prime Minister on behalf of one people promised to a second people the land that belonged to a third people. Britain wrote the Palestinian disaster. Just like it wrote the Kashmir disaster. The British Empire is responsible for more than a hundred years of desperate agony. Worse than any crucifixion of millions of Palestinian people. And so when people ask me, why are you so occupied with this issue? In my case, for 50 years, I've been in this cause. I answer, first of all, because my country caused it. And if not me, who? If not us, who? must work to expiate such a bloodbath caused by our own country. But the second reason is more human. Because I've been involved in it for 50 years, I probably know personally thousands of Palestinians. I certainly know hundreds who are now dead since October the 8th. Whole families that I know, whole families, the whole bloodline, grandfather, mother, children, all of them eliminated from this earth by this catastrophe that is underway and shows no sign of finishing. Even if the guns fall silent, which is a big if, even if any ceasefire lasts for six weeks, which is an even bigger if, the whole thing will start again. Craig made a point there of which I made a mental note. The the question is not whether we should be selling weapons to Israel. I mean, in a way, that's such a ridiculous question. Who would answer in the affirmative outside of the ranks of the British Labour Party that we should? Who? Who in Britain would say, yes, I've seen the pictures, I've seen the video, keep on selling them weapons. No sane person I could say so. The question isn't even whether we should recognize a non-existent Palestinian state. The real question is the one that Craig posed. When people ask me, does Israel have a right to exist? I answer, did apartheid South Africa have a right to exist? Did fascist Italy have a right to exist? Nazi Germany a right to exist? Did the USSR have a right to exist? Did Czechoslovakia have a right to exist? States come and go. And they go when people no longer want them, when people will no longer tolerate them. That's when they go. And if you can tolerate a state like Israel, then there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. If you can tolerate a state which is built on the bones of the people whose land they stole. A people who desecrate the holy places of others on a daily basis, the people who by law segregate their population 
in a form of apartheid even more extreme than that which existed in apartheid South Africa. There's only one solution, and that solution is one state from the river to the sea where everyone lives equal as a citizen, equal one with the other. That's the only way that we can resolve this question. I was, and I, I left my blood on the floor of the Guguletu police station in Cape Town during apartheid in South Africa. I was an undercover operative of the African National Council Congress led by Nelson Mandela, who was in Polsmore Hospital just a mile away from the Guguletu police station. When Mandela was free, by the hammer of the armed struggle of the South African people and the anvil of a worldwide international solidarity movement and became president of the first free republic of South Africa, the whites, the Boers of the Orange Free State, asked Mandela, can we have just one little piece of the country? A white state within the Republic of South Africa. And Mandela answered, we don't believe in black states or white states. We believe in democratic states where black people and white people are equal, one with the other. If that's good enough for the ending of apartheid South Africa, it's good enough for the ending of apartheid Israel. That's where we stand as a proper party. Well, we are standing 326 candidates up and down this country. That's a magic number. It's not just a magic number because it represents the biggest number of candidates like us that have ever been fielded in a British general election. It's a magic number for one other reason. If our candidates are all elected, I will be the Prime Minister of Britain. I'm not here, Starman. And if I was the Prime Minister of this country, Craig Murray would be the Foreign Secretary. And if he your MP, and if he was carried on your shoulder, I'm going to make a round of the